This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. We begin today's show with the case of two African-American half-brothers who have been exonerated of rape and murder convictions in North Carolina after over 30 years behind bars. Henry Lee McCollum and Leon Brown were found guilty in 1984 of the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl. There was no physical evidence tying them to the crime, but police obtained confessions that McCollum and Brown have always said were coerced. In fact, during his trial, McCollum recanted his confession 226 times. Police at the time <clears throat> failed to investigate another man, Roscoe Artis, who lived near the crime scene and had admitted to a similar rape and murder at around the same time. After 30 years, the case saw a major breakthrough last month when testing by North Carolina's Innocence Inquiry Commission tied Artis's DNA to the crime scene. After a hearing presenting the new evidence Tuesday, the two brothers were declared innocent and ordered freed. This is McCollum speaking Wednesday after he was released from death row. I'm happy. I'm very um, emotional. I want to you know, thank God for the glory, praise all go to him. And um, I've been through, I've been through a long journey in Central Prison. I came here in '84 with me and my brother Leon Brown, and um, it was a rough, it was a rough experience. Sometimes I felt like giving up and stuff, but I said, no, I can't do that. The life move on. I knew one day that I was gonna be blessed to get out of prison. I just didn't know when that time was gonna be. Almighty God, that kept me going strong. A lot of joy and rejoicing, happiness and everything. Cause I was very I was very anxious when they told me this news and stuff. I wanted to get away from this place. And last night I only had like a couple hours of sleep and stuff. And um it's wonderful. I'm I'm the, I just thank God. I just thank God that I'm out of this place. Both Henry McCollum and his brother Leon Brown have mental disabilities. McCollum's IQ is between 60 and 69, and Brown has scored as low as 49. Both were originally sentenced to death. After a second trial, Brown was convicted of rape and sentenced to life in prison, while McCollum remained on death row. In a recent interview with the News and Observer, after the DNA testing pointed to a likely exoneration, he said he never lost hope that he would one day see freedom. Since I've been here, I have never stopped believing that one day I would be able to walk, walk out that door. I never stopped believing that. Because long, long time, long time ago, I wanted, I wanted to find me a good wife. I wanted to raise a family. I wanted to have my own business and everything. I never, I never got the chance to uh, fulfill those dreams. Never got the chance because the people took 30 years away from me and they, and they destroyed my life. Now, I, I, believe, I believe that God is gonna bless me to get back out there. Over the years, death penalty supporters have cited the brothers' case in order to back capital punishment. In 2010, the North Carolina Republican Party pasted McCollum's mugshot on campaign mailers. In 1994, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia pointed to McCollum as an example of why the death penalty is just. For more, we go to Raleigh, North Carolina, where we're joined by Bernetta Alston. She is one of the lawyers representing Henry McCollum and a staff attorney with the Center for Death Penalty Litigation. Welcome to Democracy Now! Can you describe the scene yesterday, uh, Vernetta Alston, when uh, Henry McCollum and Leon Brown were freed? Well, I was, I was there for uh, Henry's release. I unfortunately wasn't able to go to Mare to see Leon's, but for Henry's at Central Prison, um, it was exciting. And he was happy. He was clearly relieved. His dad and stepmother were I think nervous and very excited for their son to come home. Um, and Henry, you know, had a handful of other supporters, including myself and another member of his legal team. And it was it was it was a relief. 
And Vernetta Alston, uh, could you talk a little bit about the uh, origins of the case when they were originally uh, uh, arrested uh, and the issue of the confessions and how confessions were gotten from them? Sure. So, in September of 1983, both Henry, who was 19, and Leon, who was 15, and as you mentioned, they're both intellectually disabled, um, were taken to the police, or Henry was taken to the police station by law enforcement officials and questioned for between four and five hours. And Leon came to the station, <clears throat> excuse me, um, shortly after Henry, just to, just to check, just to see what was happening. And once he got there, he was brought into a room by two other law enforcement officials, and both boys were questioned into the early hours of the, of the morning. And they were, they were manipulated <clears throat> and threatened and told that if they just signed these statements, that they could go home. And so, you know, around 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, both boys signed these statements that were uh, filled with details th that were only known to law enforcement officials at the time. And they thought that they could go home. And, you know, they quickly learned that that wasn't the case, and they were arrested. Can you talk about um, their <clears throat> protests of innocence in prison, and particularly Henry McCollum, your sure, client? So I, I represent Henry. Henry has maintained his innocence since the day he was first detained at the, the Red Springs Police Department. And he has been steadfast in that claim ever since. In every meeting that I've had with Henry over the past two and a half years, um, the only thing that he wants to, wanted to talk about was his innocence. And to prison officials, he's maintained the same refrain, that he was completely innocent of this crime, and, and, and his brother Leon was as well. I wanted to ask you about the 1994 debate where Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia pointed to Henry McCollum as an example of why the death penalty is just. Uh, he wrote, quote, for example, the case of an 11-year-old girl raped by four men and then killed by stuffing her panties down her throat. How enviable a quiet death by lethal injection compared with that of lethal injection compared with that. Scalia has long been a vocal supporter of capital punishment and has suggested that an innocent man has never been put to death, at least in recent years. Uh, Vanetta uh, uh, Alston, what would you say to Justice Scalia now? And, and he was having a debate with Justice Blackman at the time. He made that statement. He was wrong. And this case and cases like it prove that he's been wrong ever since, and he's wrong now. Um, innocent people are on death row. Innocent people likely have been put to death, and that should be a huge problem. And I think it's, it illustrates how um, irredeemable the death penalty is as a punishment. Uh, in his interview with the News and Observer, Henry McCollum said he made up the story about attacking the girl Sabrina Bowie so he could just go home after he'd been interrogated for several hours. In this clip, he describes the detective's behavior during questioning and his response. I was like sitting in a chair and he got up in my face, hollering at me. That kind of, that kind of shook me. It scared me up a little bit. You know, because I had never, I had never been in no police station before being questioned by police. And then he, he to my, you know, you kill that girl, you know, you kill that girl. I said, man, I ain't killing nobody, man. I ain't seen that girl that night. And um, he said, when I come back in this, come back in here, you better tell me the truth and all that, right? I said, I told you the truth where I was that night. He said, no, you told me you was at home. I said, that was where I was at home. I wasn't out on twelve thirty at night. I say he came back in like five minutes later. I had made up my mind, right? Because I had never been under this much pressure of a person hollering at me and threatening me and all that crazy stuff. So what I did, I gave him uh, false names and made up a story. This is the way the crime happened when, when the crime didn't really happen that way and all that, right? Because I was trying to go home. I gave a false confession.
That was uh, Henry McCollum in prison in that interview. Vernetta Alston, if you could uh, respond to what he said. Uh, Henry McCollum had two trials? Uh, he did. He did. And uh, we, we know now that this, that he was threatened, that, you know, because of his disabilities, because he was poor and, and wasn't in a position intellectually to defend himself, that he was manipulated in, in, that, in that confession and, and forced to uh, tell a story, again, so that what he, he thought he could go home. That's what they told him. They said if he, if he, if he gave them that information, that he could leave. Um, uh, Vernetta Alston, I want to ask you not only about the—you've uh, talked about the police misconduct in this case in terms of the uh, mm -hmm. confessions, but what about the prosecution withholding evidence that could have been used to exonerate the men? Could you talk about that as well? Absolutely. So one of the biggest pieces and one of the most alarming things that we've learned uh, in the last few months through the Innocence Inquiry Commission's work is that law enforcement had requested that a fingerprint, a known fingerprint— found at the crime scene next to sticks with the victim's blood on it, um, a request had been made for that fingerprint to be compared to Roscoe Artis, um, whose DNA was found at the scene and who committed uh, a, a very similar rape three weeks later. Um, rape and that murder, request right. Of rape and murder, correct. So that request was, was made three days before Henry's trial and was never carried out. And based on what we know now, that request was never divulged to Henry's trial attorneys uh, by the state. And that represents a, a, a huge violation of Henry and Leon's constitutional rights. And these cases, in 1984, uh, were prosecuted by Joe Freeman Britt, um, who was a notorious, um, notorious supporter of the death penalty and who secured between 40 and 50 death sentences during his tenure as district, district attorney. Um, and so I think what we've seen as a pattern in, in those cases is that he was incredibly reckless to the point where all but two of his convictions and his death sentences have been overturned. Um, and the only two that haven't are folks who have been executed. Hmm. Um, and so I think that should signal a huge problem with all of his cases in terms of what he's turned over, what he hasn't, and his own rush to judgment and his own priorities in getting a conviction rather than seeking the truth. We're going to continue this discussion after break. Renetta Alston, stay with us. One of the lawyers for Henry McCollum and a staff attorney for the Center for Death Penalty Litigation. When we come back, we'll also be joined by Steve Drizzen, who is the legal director of the Center on Wrongful Convictions. Stay with us.